children from outside the home or the illegitimate ones. Looking in totality for Moi's videos, he must have made those who voted for Kenya Kwanza as the legitimate children and those who did not vote for Kenya Kwanza as the legitimate children. We have seen him saying he has no apologies to make, notwithstanding that these utterances, to quote the media house, were leaving a bad taste in the mouths of many people. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, he is very loudly clear that he has no apologies to make for calling, for referring to Kenya, for saying Kenya is a company belonging to shareholders for the benefit of the shareholders. That defiance and the stance that he has no apology to make, does it depict the deportment of a man or a woman who should be the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya? Not at all. But you, uh, you heard his counsel say that there must be some extraordinary wrongdoing before we can impeach for mere utterances or for the things you have alleged. To the best of your knowledge, sir, how many vice presidents or deputy presidents has Kenya had since 1963? In your estimate, how many? 11. 11. 11 or thereabout? Let, let's say a dozen, 12, right? Yes. Do we have in our history since 1963 experience of a deputy president who traverses the country preaching ethnic exclusion? I don't remember any. The only incident I remember, two incidences, mm. when Jaramogi differed with Kenyatta and he did the moral thing, resigned from government. I also remember an incident, I think it was Vice President Morumbi, who also differed with the then president and did the honorable thing and resigned from government. Those who are the first two vice presidents, Daniel Arap Moy was at that. Do you know of any incident where Daniel Arap Moy was moving around this country as vice president, Did what? committing this type of wrongdoing? No, not at all. How about Moy Kibaki? In fact, even when he was demoted, he continued working in cabinet. How about Josephat Karanja? Not at all. How about George Saitoti? Even when he was, uh, he was sacked, he continued being loyal to the government of the day. How about Musalim Devadi? In his short stint, nothing is hard about him undermining his boss. How about the country? Modi Awari? Not at all. Kalonzo Musioka? Not at all. So when we are told there is nothing extraordinary about this wrongdoing, is that consistent with the lived reality of Kenya? There is everything extraordinary when a country of 46 tribes, someone advocates for the servicing of less than two of their, those communities. Where will the 44 go? Given the politics of 41 against one in 2007 and the post-election violence, would this allegation be extraordinary wrongdoing? It is an extraordinary wrongdoing. In fact, the post-election violence that resulted from that particular kind of campaign was in itself extremely dangerous to our social fabric and extremely dangerous to our economy. Given the experience of the Molo and Likoni clashes in the 90s, would this be extraordinary wrongdoing coming from the second senior most state officer? Indeed, and also when it is remembered that he was a district officer in Molo when those clashes were happening. Given what is going on right now as we speak in Tana River, who would conduct like this emanating from none other than the deputy of the president be extraordinary misconduct? I have seen in news that there are families that are displaced, people have lost property, and if that is not extraordinary, then I do not know what extraordinary means. Given, sir, and I will summarize this, what this type of campaign achieved in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in former Yugoslavia, in Nigeria, the Biafra War, and we could count and count until the cows go home. Can anyone be heard in good conscience to say 
that this is not extraordinary misconduct. Indeed, that, that, this is ex, ex, very extraordinary, requiring impeachment. Please confirm, because we are pressed for time, that the evidence you're relying on on this ground applies equally to allegation number five of your motion. Just a minute to confirm. What is your complaint in allegation number five? Allegation number five, Mr. Speaker, will be at page 16 to 17 of volume two. Allegation number five, just a minute. Uh, Mr. Speaker, honorable members, our allegation number five relates to gross violation of article three, one of the constitution and article 148.5a of the constitution, which particularly, specifically, is in relation to the breach of the oath of office and allegiance. Does the oath of office require the deputy president to promote national unity or the shareholder politics? The oath of office demands of the deputy president to promote national unity. And what is your complaint in ground number six, sir? In ground number six, That again is on page 16 to 17, Mr. Speaker. Ground number six is about serious reasons to believe that the Deputy President has committed a crime under national law pursuant to Article 151B and 2 of the Constitution. And what is the specific complaint? The specific complaint is that uh, there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes under Section 13, 1, A, and 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act. Can you please read for us those sections of the law? Section 13 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act provides that it is an offense. Honorable Speaker, that, that section will be in Volume 7 of the Assembly's documents. That it is, it is an offense for any person to use threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior where the person intends to stir up feelings of ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. The section also makes it an offense to use words or engage in such behavior when, having regard to all the circumstances, ethnic hatred is likely to be stirred up. Is ethnic hatred likely to be stirred up by this campaign of shareholding? Obviously. Is it likely to stir up ethnic contempt? Obviously. What does Section 62 say? Section 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act states that a person commits an offense when the person makes statements that are intended or are likely to stir up feelings of ethnic, ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. Are the utterances by the deputy president likely to trigger any of those things? Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, Honorable Mutuse, that law you just read, National Cohesion and Integration, was indeed the law parliament enacted to ensure we never go back to where our country was in 2007, 2008, in because fact, of utterances like this. It was pursuant to the post-election violence and the country resolved that we needed a law as a result. And therefore, it is a law that is supposed to ensure that we in office live to promote national unity and not the opposite. Given that history and why that law exists, sir, we repeat the question. Has the deputy president committed ordinary or extraordinary wrongdoing? He has, under Article 150 of the Constitution, in relation to this ground, there are serious reasons to believe that he has committed wrongs against the National Cohesion and Integration Act, and if extraordinary in nature. 
and, 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 and if you allow me, these are not my words. Uh -huh. I have been accused of urging the National Assembly to believe me. These are not my words, they are words of the Constitution under Article 150. Thank you. I want this, Mr. Speaker, we are urging the Senate if you consider the evidence so far adduced, then that evidence applies to Ground 1, 5, and 6. So we are prosecuting them together to save on time. Let's go to allegation number seven, sir. Mr. Speaker, that allegation runs from pages 17 to 31. It was the one you were told runs from falsehoods, culminating in the embarrassing and other things. Let's see whether it is actually falsehoods, embarrassing, and the other adjectives that we were told that I would urge members to work with me by holding volume 2A, volume 2A of the assembly's documents, together with our volume 6. 6, I only mention it briefly. Please confirm, sir, at page two of volume six, who as between you and the deputy president as passions were cast, that you are referring to irrelevant material about the estate of the lady Ritu Gajegua. Between you and the deputy president, who has brought up this issue of the estate? Is it you or is it him? In the response by the deputy president, on page two of volume six. He did, he did bring out the issue of the estate of his late brother in response to the allegations that he has acquired properties worth 5.2 billion within, a period that, within the period that he has been deputy president. So we'll come back to that document much later. I'm only mentioning it now, sir, to clear the hair, whether it is you trying to weep emotions by bringing up this matter, or it is the deputy president attempting, by his own response, to hide behind the shadow of his late brother? I never mentioned any of my deceased relatives. I have them, but I never mentioned any. The deputy president is the one who mentioned his deceased it, relatives. He's actually the one who has brought this material, isn't it? Indeed. Good. Now we'll come to it. Let's go back to your allegation. Ground number seven, sir. Can you tell the Senate in summary, we are so pressed for time, what is... Mr. Speaker, honorable members, underground number seven, our allegation is that there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes under section 45.1, 46, 47A3, and 48.1 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, as well as sections 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Proceeds of Crime and the Money Laundering Act. And in short, we, during the short period that I was doing research on this motion, I have come across properties that are registered in the name of the Deputy President or in the name of his children or other proxies that run cumulatively to a value of about 5.2 billion. And there is no clear trace of where the money is to purchase those properties came from. And therefore, under the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, qualify to be unexplained assets. Number two, I have also listed companies, companies that are associated with the Deputy President, 22 of them. And these companies, you look at the objects and purposes, they are all the same. And it is our theory and our evidence that these companies have been used for money laundering. Similarly, I have also listed companies that have been transacting with the office of the Deputy President, the office held by the Deputy President, His Excellency Rigathi Keshago, with tremendous respect. And they are being paid from that office, and we have laid ground for serious reasons to believe that these companies are actually conduits for corruption, and that political responsibility, even when he's not the accounting officer, rests with the highest holder of that office. And that is the case we are making here. And we shall be showing the connection between the properties 
and His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa. And in a case of unexplained assets, it is upon the person to show where they actually got the money to buy the assets. We have evidence that the assets belong to him. Let, let's begin with the company, Honorable Motuze. You said you have attached from CR12 to your motion. Indeed, I have attached from CR12, being evidence of ownership of those companies. Directors. Would that be the form CR12 on pages 8, all the way to 32 of volume 2A? Indeed, yes. Honorable Speaker, it's volume 2A, pages 8 to 32. It actually begins, Honorable Speaker, it's me who is mistaken. It's from page 1 to 32, right? Indeed, yes. And because we are stressed for time, sir, does this document show in black and white that the majority of these companies, the directors and shareholders, are either the deputy president or his sons or his spouse? Yes, they do, and senators will have opportunity to look at the form CR12. Many of them are under two weeks old, so they are very recent. Let's go to the question of the purchase and, and of... You can, also, you can also independently confirm from the e-citizen portal, it is only 650 shillings to do as a company such. You, you have mentioned Tree Tops Hotel and Ausspan Hotel in paragraph 45A. Yes, indeed. Let's confirm whether this is false, ridiculous, or embarrassing. Did the deputy president issue a public address on the 7th of October in which he admitted acquiring these two hotels? Yes, indeed, and it is part of our evidence. So without admission from him, can we be here to say your allegations are false, ridiculous, and embarrassing. That is not expected from the son of Mau Mau. But let's go to page 33, sir, of your volume 2, eh? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have been um, patiently waiting and restraining myself from pause, raising... Pause the time for the National Assembly, please. I've Proceed, Council. I've been constraining myself when listening to the proceedings, and Council is testifying instead of the witness testifying. Number two, is asking leading questions in examination in chief. And council understands the rules of examination. A case in point, you're very general. A case in point? Yeah, yeah, the, the Hansons, Mr. Speaker, sir, will bear us witness, and the Senate is a custodian of the Hanson. Council, I'm very alert. Any leading questions? Before you, even, you take your feet, I'll be able to Object to it. I'm, I'm very alive to that. Proceed, Council. Much obliged, Mr. Speaker. Let's go to page 33, sir. What is that document on volume 2A? On page 33, this is a discharge of charge between Wayne Holdings Limited and Abadea Safari Lodges Limited. Yes. Drawn by the firm of Hamilton, Harris, and Matthews. On page 34, what is given as the amount of the loan being discharged? The loan being discharged is 143,885,042 shillings. Please confirm this loan is being discharged as of 30th October 2023. Yes, the loan is being discharged as out of 30th October 2023. And the loan was to Abadea Safari Hotels Limited. Would that mean this hotel was indebted before the deputy president acquired it? It was inevitable. To what amount? 143,885,042 shillings. Let's go to page 37. What is that document you have annexed, sir? The document I have annexed here is a transfer instrument, transferring 
transfer to companies and limited liability partnerships. Yes. It is a doc it's a document ordinarily that is used to transfer interest in what? Interest in, in, in property from one party to the next. And who is acquiring the, that property according to this document? The property is at this time belonged to Abadea Safari Hotels Limited and is being transferred to Crystal Kenya Limited. Is Crystal Kenya Limited a company linked to the Deputy President? Yes, indeed, and we have annexed its the form CR12. In which page? The form CR12 is on page 23 of our volume 2A. Of our volume 2A. Who are given as the directors there? The directors are one Keith Ikino Rigadi. Who is that? That is a son to Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa. Yes. And the second director is Kevin Gashagwa Rigadi. Yes. Also a son. Now let's go back to 37. As the deputy president in his response explained, where he got more than half a billion shillings, and to be precise, 535 million to acquire this hotel. Uh, to begin with, the consideration for this transfer was Kenya shillings 535 million, and this needs to be added to the loan of 143 million. Yes. Cumulatively. Yes. So that you get the value, because the value of, of in terms of the the, what, what, was, what was the purchase. Yes. In his response, and I have seen it, mm -hmm. the Deputy President alludes that he got a loan of 600 million, that when he became Deputy President, he used to run this company called Cristo, but when he became Deputy President, he gave it to his children to run it. And he goes further to say that uh, he got a loan of 600 million from the Credit Bank of Kenya. Has he actually placed before this Senate evidence of the disbursement of any such loan? I have seen a letter of offer for that loan, but it, I have not seen any evidence of disbursement nor any charge in respect of that loan. Is a letter of offer loan evidence that a loan has actually been given? A letter of offer is just that, an offer. That letter is a next of offer says that as security for the supposed loan, there will be director's guarantees. Has he annexed those director's guarantees? I have, to the best of my recollection, I have not seen them. It says the, the loan will be secured by personal guarantees. Has he also annexed those personal guarantees? I have not seen them. Has he annexed any security known in the banking world for acquiring a loan of this amount? What I have seen is what I have seen in the letter of offer is at uh, I'm looking at it is in terms of the lien and set off at yes. page 132 or 534 is that lien and set off of a fixed Please deposit. Please say which volume you're referring to on the page so no. that the Senate will work Council, with you. I'm refer the I'm senators would wish to know I'm, I'm where the letter of offer is contained. Which volume? The letter of offer, volume, what, Mr. Speaker. Which page? What page? It, it's in volume six. Is it volume six, at starting from page 98. Yes, walk us through that letter of offer. So the, there is a letter of offer, meaning there was an application for a loan. And this is uh, to the directors of Crystal Kenya Limited. Crystal Kenya Limited is the company that is acquiring uh, Safari, Abadea Safari Lodges. And the loan is in respect of uh, an amount of 600 million. And in the clause for lien and set off, I have seen that uh, a lien and set of our fixed deposits, this is on page 99, in respect of INO Crystal Kenya Limited for an aggregate amount of 300 million to be obtained. Interest accrued shall be credited to your deposit settlement account. Let, let's stick to that one for now. From elementary banking knowledge, 
what do we conclude from this issue of the 300 million? My understanding is that the account held at the bank at 300 million shillings in cash, and that uh, that amount was going to be part of the security for the loan. So it means the deputy president or his sons had already cash in that account of 300 million shillings? Yes, which is also an asset that we are counting in accumulating the 5.2 billion. Now let's count that, sir, 300 million, 535 million, and the 143 million that had been to be paid to pave way for this transaction. Indeed, yes. In estimate, that would be like how much money? 535 plus 300. Is 835 plus 143, roughly a billion shillings. Roughly a billion shillings. In respect of one transaction. Just one property. Now, if the deputy president were to save all his net salary for 10 years, would he be able to have savings of a billion shillings to acquire this hotel? Not at all. From, but because. From the non. From the non, from the non source, legitimate source of income, which is his salary as deputy president, as gazetted by the SRC, roughly around 1.2 billion after taxation, an aggregate of a million shillings, it would not be possible to acquire a billion, a billion shillings within a period of two years. Now, these three figures, sir, whether it is the 143 million or the 300 million or the 535 million, has the deputy president in his response offered any legitimate explanation of how he or his very young sons came upon this incredible fortune of money? Nowhere in the response other than the, the letter of offer that is in, his loan, in itself not evidence of acquiring a loan. A page 39 was shown as the parties to this transaction for Abadea's hotel? Page that nine of, uh, of volume 2A. Page 39 of volume 2A. The parties to this transaction for Crystal Kenya Limited, Kevin Gashagwa Rigadi and Keith Ikino Rigadi. For Abadea Safari Hotels, there is Robert Gadenji yes. and Kenneth Waiboshi. Are, are those two gentlemen you mentioned first related to the Deputy President? Indeed, they are his children. As a matter of fact, Honorable Mutusen will do it in the closing statement. Does our Public Officer Ethics Act or the Leadership and Integrity Act faced with facts like this permit the Deputy President to hide behind his sons? Not at all. Is he allowed to hide behind any of his relatives? Not at all. What about his spouse? Not at all. So even if the Senate were to accept for argument's sake that this company is run by the sons and whatnot, would that based on the, our Public Officer Ethics Act or the other act, which is the leadership, and would that be a valid answer to this unexplained wealth? Section 35 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Please say the volume you're reading. I'm reading from volume seven in our band of documents at page 34, acting through others. A state officer contravenes the code if the officer A causes anything to be done through another person that would constitute a contravention of the code if done by the state officer or allows or directs a person under their supervision or control to do anything that is in contravention of the code. Mr. Speaker, acting through others is what previously I have called it wasn't me. But let's jump to page 79 of volume 2A. Yes, we are here. 
Again, this is documentation for that same property the deputy president admits he acquired, right? Yes, through Abadea, just for contextualization, Abadea owned two hotels. Yes. There is Street Ops Hotel. Yes. And there is... There is which one? Outspan. Yes. Outspan is the one that we have demonstrated how it was purchased. Treetops mm -hmm. is a property developed by the Kenya Wildlife Service, but it was under the same management of Abadea, so they were acquired together. So let, let's pause at it is owned by the Kenya Wildlife Service. Yes. Is the Kenya Wildlife Service a public or a private entity? A public entity funded by the taxpayers. Under our Chapter 6 laws, that is the Public Officer Ethics Act, the Leadership and the Integrity Act, if you want, you can even draw the Public Procurement and Disposal Act, whichever law. Is it consistent with all those laws for the Deputy President of the Republic to acquire without competitive bidding an interest in a resource owned by the Kenya Wildlife Service? It is not. And in fact, the Deputy President is on record in these proceedings as having said that he advised his, his, his family not to transact with government. But we are going to demonstrate that he actually transacted with KWS. And KWS is a public entity. And KWS is a public entity. If this hotel were to be leased or sold, or whatever the language, would there be a requirement for open, competitive, and transparent bidding? Section 45, which we said we have reasonable grounds to believe that the pres Deputy President has breached of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act. And I'm reading our volume seven at page 23, states as follows. Protection of public property and revenue. A person is guilty of an offense if the person fraudulently or otherwise unlawfully, A, acquires public property or public service or benefit, B, mortgages, charges, or disposes of any public property, C, damages public property, including causing a computer or another electronic machinery to perform any function that directly or indirectly results in a loss or adversely affects any public revenue or service, or fails to pay any taxes or any fees, levies, charges payable to any public body, or effects, or obtains an exemption, remission, reduction, or abatement from payment of any such taxes, levies, and fees. Section 46, about abuse of office. A person who uses his office to improperly confer a benefit on himself or anyone else is guilty of an offense. Now, let's go to page 81 of volume 2 A, sir. It's still about three tops hotel. Page? 81 of yes. volume 2A. I'm there. Can you read for us the last sentence of the second paragraph? This is a letter. This is a letter from uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service. Yes. To Mr. Amos Kisilo of Kisilo and Wandati Company Advocates. It's a letter dated when? The letter is dated. Uh, at the top left, what Dated is the date? 5th, 5th of June, 2023. Was His Excellency the Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa, the Deputy President of Kenya on that date? Yes. It is addressed to who? It is addressed to Kisilo Wandati and Company Advocates. In the Deputy President's own response, as, is that law firm indicated as one of the law firms he uses? Yes, indeed. Good. Now read for us the second paragraph of that letter, beginning with the word, however. However, the tenant is in rent arrears of Kenya shillings 35 million, 481, 548, and lodge has not been operational since 2019, which has resulted to deterioration of the same in breach of the lease agreement. So we are being told this hotel a number of things. One, it has not been in operation for four years, correct? Indeed. And as a result, it has accumulated 
rent arrears, correct or incorrect? And the deteriorated, which in effect means it requires renovation money. Now let's go to page 80 where the deputy president develops interest in the hotel. I'm here. Can you read the opening line of that, the first paragraph of that letter? Mr. Speaker, honorable senators, this is a letter from Kisilo and Dati and Company Advocates. Does that letter disclose the identity of the client anyway? No, it doesn't. And it is a requirement that you must disclose the client even as you move ahead. Is that how lawyers usually write letters in honest, genuine transactions? Not at all. Good. Now let's go. And I am one of them, so I know. To KWS Main Collection Standard Chartered Bank account and the amount of 611 to KRIF for 2% withholding tax. So, Honorable Motuse, what do you have to tell the Senate of the fact a company that was in arrears for four years, 35 million, it is in distress, it's not in operation, the deputy president shows interest and suddenly it is able to pay these arrears of that five million? The deputy president must be magical. Okay. Associating with the deputy president must be very magical because you have not operated for over four years, you are in debt, you have not been able to service that debt for four years, but you have just interacted with him for a month and you pay your debt overnight. Now, when you see that, sir, is it consistent with the narrative that your allegations are false, ridiculous?